All right, well, welcome back everyone. So this marks our last, I guess, um, semi-official lecture of the semester. Um, next week is the last week of the semester, as far as I know. And that's when we will listen to your final presentations for your research projects. Today is the last time we're discussing some uh, sort of other technical content that's not your own research. Um, so I propose to continue the discussion we started last Tuesday. It was very engaging. I really enjoyed that. So let's continue that. Um, maybe let's start with Ben, since we sort of cut you short on Tuesday. Um, and we'll use the remaining time for, um, for Kyle. How's that? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so I guess I can share. I don't have slides, but I have the text so that we can um, refer to some things together. Um, can you all see that OK? All right. Yeah, it's, it's on now. Great. Um, so I guess coming from last Tuesday's discussion, we were in a somewhat depressing point um, where we basically had uh, you know, you give data scientists the same data, the same hypothesis, and we find that they don't actually end up converging on uh, the same takeaways. And so this is, you know, an issue of researcher bias. Um, and we might be wondering, you know, how this looks like in, in other areas. Uh, this paper addresses the same kind of issue um, in a different way. So they're looking at the field of software defect prediction uh, using machine learning techniques. Um, and you know what we would expect from a body of research like this is for um, the you know, various research groups and um, people over time kind of converging on the same kind of, the same you know, kinds of outcomes where they find that certain, um, input metrics correspond to certain uh, prediction results, um, and that certain classifiers are better in certain contexts and not better in other contexts. Um, but since all of these uh, different software defect uh, prediction techniques um, and research projects can have uh, different data sets uh, and different uh, evaluation techniques, it's actually quite hard to I guess, figure out if this convergence and progress is occurring. Um, and so this research project uh, looked to do a meta-analysis of the field. Um, they started with 202 uh, primary studies and then kind of filtered that down to 42 that uh, fit certain quality metrics that they wanted um, and had the types of data available so that they could kind of reconstruct a universal performance metric that they can share um, and kind of comparatively evaluate these different research outcomes. Um, and so in order to do their meta-analysis, they first kind of realize that software defect prediction relies on these four components. So you need some learning technique um, from which your classifier is going to be you know, derived. You need a data set to train and evaluate your classifier on. And you need certain input metrics to, so like which features are you pulling from your data um, in order to get your predictive power. And um, ultimately, ultimately you'll have some sort of uh, way of evaluating your predictive performance. Um, and so their research uh, ultimately, oops, so they ended up kind of evaluating all of these different uh, research works. Um, and they tried to pull these four um, characteristics of different research projects uh, to evaluate each of their performance. And then ideally, you would have um, these four uh, performance metrics to kind of predict the success of the different research outcomes. And if we are seeing you know, progress and convergence in the field, we would hope that you know, the data set being used, uh, there might be better data sets out there and worse data sets out there. Um, 
So we might converge on some best data set, and we might also converge on some best set of input metrics or features being used, and we might converge on some best you know, classifier metric, at least in certain contexts. They also include the research group in here, which is, you know, not to spoil the ending, but the research group ends up being um, the overwhelmingly uh, predictive factor. So, um, the so given an arbitrary research project, we could expect that its performance. Um, we can explain the most amount of its performance just from the researcher group itself, rather than from any of the uh, things that we would think that actually matter in the research project. Um, and this brings up a lot of interesting questions. Um, in the paper, the, the authors make um, some pretty extreme claims uh, about kind of the importance of research in this field and the validity of it. Um, specifically, they say that um, from their results, they find that 30% of the performance, the variance in the data can be explained just by the researcher group alone. And this is um, higher than anything else. Oh, sorry, I think I'm a bit lost here. Yeah, it's right here in table 14. You can see the researcher group explains 31% of the variance. Data set explains 11.2. Um, the interaction between the researcher group and the classifier is 6.6. .6. And you know, here you can see the metric and the classifier explain very little of the variance in the outcomes of these research uh, works. And so the authors um, kind of make the claim here that until we can address the reason why these different research groups um, explain 30% of the variance in the data, the overwhelming majority of it that we can explain, uh, the entire field is basically not worth exploring because we don't have valid results. So I think this is um, a good jumping off point for discussion. Uh, do you think that, do you agree with the authors that um, this is kind of the thing that we need to address before continuing in on the field of software defect prediction? You know, Ben, when you started, I thought the overall level of optimism that we left uh, off with on Tuesday was going to go up, not down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's going down in a different dimension, I guess. So, like, let me uh, let me ask so related questions about this. Um, first question is: We know that all studies are flawed, all methods are flawed, and no study is ever flawless. Um, why should we trust this study? that you've presented um, enough or, or more, so, more so than the original studies it reviews? Yeah, so that is an, an important point that I, I think I might have glossed over is they, so meta-analysis is kind of a tricky thing to synthesize a lot of different research projects into kind of a couple key metrics and a couple key components. Um, and so they were very careful about, um, they also critiqued other meta-analyses. Um, they uh, kind of spoke to the validity of their approach because they um, went with only the highest quality um, research studies. So things that were published in you know, top conferences, they have certain metrics that they, I think they pulled from a different paper, highlighting, you know, quality metrics um, of research papers. So they only chose papers that were good, um, reputable, and then they also were able to kind of come up with this universal performance metric um, for all of the various approaches. There is there are still some questions about, you know, because I, I agree that this 
this uh, research study could also have probably been done in certain ways. And um, from our talk last Tuesday, we might also expect that different approaches might yield different results. And I'm assuming that the researchers that designed the study had certain thoughts going into the study um, about you know, uncovering researcher bias. Um, so I guess the, the ultimate answer is that we don't really know, but it, um, I guess I, I don't have any you know, glaring issues. I think one of the biggest problems that I had with the way that they approached the data was how they kind of split up certain things. So like they, they needed to chunk different types of research in, in ways somehow. Um, and so like coming up with performance metrics or coming up with input metrics, like classifying those, they only changed it from like, they only filtered it down to static methods, which really comprises 84.5% of, you know, the approaches. And then as compared to like process metrics and delta metrics and combinations of these different approaches. Um, and I think that since the range of you know, static approaches is quite large, we might expect the researcher groups, maybe certain researcher groups are just better at applying um, these different techniques, which could explain their better performance. Um, but yeah, I, I think I guess that, that's a good question to ask. Um, and I don't have a great answer. Follow up to this. It seems to me like in order to do a meta analysis like this one, you would first need to agree on the definition of defects. If you're, so the pur purpose of this is defect prediction or a comparison of different defect prediction techniques, algorithms, classifiers, whatever, predictors. Um, but is the definition of defect sort of uniform across all of the studies that they compared or the approaches they compared? That, that by itself seems to be a sort of high point of variance. Yeah, they, since I think the, all of the data that they were using um, had data sets with like labeled defects, um, they had ground truth data for what defects they were detecting. Um, I think one of the big ones was a NASA data set. And then I forget the other one, but they had like basically two big data sets. And I think they were only focusing on um, research where they basically had some big data set and uh, they were evaluating it against known defects. But even what constitutes a defect? So, you know, I could think of different definitions for what a defect is. Is it a failing test case? That's a defect. Is it um, I don't know, something else? Is it a, 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 is a typo a defect? Um, is it sort of a performance thing, a defect? Um, even even if the test case isn't failing. So kind of what, what is and isn't a defect is I guess what I'm asking. Um, I think, I don't remember quite how they defined it, but I think that they were kind of going off of, I guess what the community had determined and just assuming that a defect is something that has been labeled as a defect and everything else isn't a defect. Um, and so I think since they're all sharing the same, yeah, so I, I guess the issue would be if different studies did not share the same definition of defects in the data sets. But I think that since, since they were, for the most part, using the same data that define defects in the same ways, I don't think that that would be too much cause for concern. Um, the reason I was asking is that I think this is going to come up in uh, in Kyle's 
set of papers as well. The so definition of defects is one of the things the two sets of authors were um, arguing over and, and those other two studies. Um, so it seems like there's, you know, that, that by itself is um, a source of possible uh, variance between these sets of results that um, I, I I didn't know if they had accounted for in this meta analysis or or not. So it sounds from what you're saying that they may not have. They're sort of relying on the correctness of these labels. Yeah, I I think that they're relying on the correctness of the labels and that the um, I guess research papers that they're studying have a shared sense of what a what a defect is that they're looking for. What about back to your original question? So should we just stop with defect prediction if we kind of come up with different results? I guess what you're asking. Um, yeah, this just seemed like a, a bit of a contentious claim that they're making. Um, and I was wondering if anybody had any thoughts um, on this. I, I guess the underlying question is, yeah, assuming the results of this study are valid um, and that basically this research is too noisy to uh, pull anything meaningful out of. We're not converging um, on any shared results. Um, is the issue that we haven't found the right metrics yet, or maybe we don't have the right data set yet that results in you know, valid outcomes? Uh, and so the authors are kind of proposing that we first investigate um, why this is the case. And if the answer is just that, you know, different research groups kind of abuse the data more than other research groups to get to um, their results, then I guess the, the outcome is that we haven't found any uh, meaningful ways to predict defects. Well, actually, I have an idea. So, so kind of related to what I posted in this, um, no, not Discord, uh, Slack. Um, so, I think the goal for for this community is, uh, for example, for using machine learning to predict defects. The goal is kind of can we build a machine learning model that can predict the the defects or find the defects, uh, and the so so the model the model is kind of the the technical part. And so this paper basically kind of is trying to claim that, okay, so no matter what kind of model you use, the most kind of influential uh, factor is the research group. But in fact, I'm thinking that in machine learning community, they, so instead of like kind of what kind of classifier world, so for instance, SVM or deep learning, something like that, they, they often have some tricks like, like data pro, um, pre-processing or post-processing but often these tricks, they are not reported in the, in the paper. So I think this kind of tricks should also be part of the, the technique they reported, but a lot of researchers, they choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why, so maybe that's why that this paper find that, okay, a, research, a good research group can, can, can kind of build a good model, even with some simple uh, machine learning technique. I think it's because they kind of, they, well, it's not intentionally hiding something. It's just they, 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 they find that, okay, these kind of tricks are, are trivial, but in fact, it's not. That's mm -hmm. my understanding. So then I guess a follow-up question to that is, should we, like before continuing on this research path, try to define um, like a way to standardize um, you know, what kind of pre-processing you can do, um, what kind of 
these like small things that certain researcher groups might know how to optimize better than others? Should we just try to tell people not to optimize these things and just rely on the metrics alone? Or what do you think? Yeah, I think so. I think in, in machine learning community, they also trying to advocate that um, we should all kind of uh, also public our uh, like the, the code they use. So because often they are based on some public data set, right? So so most researchers they will they will develop their model based on the same data set. So at least this part is the same. So if they can also public their all their code, like how they how they can do the pre-processing, how they report the how they kind of create the graph in, in the in the paper. So if we if we public all this all this kind of source code. I think at least we have a way to replicate or or review uh, the results, right? It it sounds to me, Ben, like it's more about reporting than about standardizing the the method. It's more about standardizing the reporting of the implementation of the method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess the the reporting would <laughs> certainly help for like reproducibility concerns. Um, but I, I think the issue of the issue still remains that like, since we don't have a complete understanding of how, um, these different tweaks can affect the results, we, if everybody's kind of doing their own tweaks, um, to varying degrees and publish their results, unless you can directly compare um, the things being studied. So kind of going back up to their core components where the learning technique, um, the defect data set being used and the types of in input metrics being used. If you can't um, isolate these variables and evaluate those variables, even if you're reporting everything, it might still just be too noisy to pull anything meaningful out of like a body of research rather than a single research paper. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think I agree with the spirit of this, but I'd be careful to be too critical um, based on just the single meta analysis, especially since, it, it, so for example, um, it's not obvious to me that there are no mediators that they have not accounted for here. Um, the effect they're claiming is that of researchers. But building on CJ's point, what if researchers um, is um, sort of hiding this underlying thing, which is the actual tricks and hacks and so on? Um, so it's it's not researchers per se. It's not it's not perhaps like in Bobo's paper from Tuesday that given the same data set and the same analysis, people would. Uh, come up with widely different conclusions, but it's maybe that these different researchers are just applying different hacks and tricks to squeeze more accuracy, more performance out of these classifiers. Um, and it's really those tricks that are explaining this difference in, um, in, I don't know, predictive power of these things rather than the people themselves. So, so I think I agree that we need to sort of better understand why we're seeing this um, strong effect of, of researcher in, in this particular analysis. But I don't know if I'd agree that we're, we're done with defect prediction. We should just give up on that completely. Yeah, I, I agree that the authors are a bit, I think, extreme and trying to be controversial in um, in their paper. But I guess speaking to what you were just saying um, about how it's not necessarily the authors doing anything wrong, but 
they're just kind of, you know, optimizing um, on different types of things, more just like data science-y things rather than um, anything more fundamental. Um, and I guess, is is the research like in software defect prediction, are we just trying to come up with the like best classifier or are we trying to understand like the components that make a good classifier? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Great. Yeah, great. So we're coming back to the, um, uh, you got to have a theory lecture from earlier in the semester. Uh, and I think this was maybe um, one of the examples we discussed back then, this example of defect prediction. The other one was that example of um, the experiment they conducted in the 1700s to uh, cure scurvy in uh, British sailors. Uh, they didn't really understand why lemons or, or citrus fruits or vitamin C rather um, helps cure scurvy. They didn't know sort of what caused scurvy and, and to why vitamin C was the cure for it. They just sort of noticed that um, eating lemons and oranges was helpful. So here maybe it's some of the same thing. Um, maybe we don't have this complete understanding, this theory of, of how defects happen and, and why and how to prevent them. Um, but it could still be useful to predict them um, because you know we are an engineering discipline and we need to, um, I don't know, allocate resources and prioritize things and, and spend uh, re resources effectively as as effectively as we can and to some extent this helps with that right because it sort of helps maybe prioritize uh, code review and other things like this that um, are a, a scarce limited resource but I think so I think you're right I think we shouldn't stop with this I think this is just a, um, a step towards perhaps this deeper understanding that we really should be aiming towards but also that it could be useful just to have this. I hope we don't stop with this, but I think it may be useful to have this. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't know what you all think. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you that it is useful to have um, this kind of thing. And I, I think that, yeah, the, the authors of this paper take things to a bit of an extreme level. Um, so the authors also, along with kind of highlighting problems, they try to uh, come up with some uh, proposed ways to mitigate the problems. Um, so they make two points, or I guess three points, two major points that I saw. Um, one is that we need to better communicate and document the details of the classifier techniques. This is a lot of what I think CJ was highlighting, um, these little hacks and uh, little pre-processing tricks that increase their performance. They should be documented so that, you know, maybe a further meta-analysis meta can identify which hacks are better for which contexts and um, maybe learn from that unexplained uh, variance. They also mentioned that joint comparative empirical studies of defect prediction between research centers so that you can, so that as the research is occurring, they're kind of doing this comparative evaluation rather than trying to pull um, disparate studies apart kind of constructing research studies such that they can be directly comparable. Mm -hmm. um, and then they also talk about um, blinding. Uh, so blinding is the idea that, you know, you are handling your data in a way that you don't know which treatment was applied to which part of your data. Um, 
And this is one way of mitigating researcher bias. Uh, and the authors make the claim that blind analysis should be, you know, mandatory for all um, serious computational research. Do you, I guess, just to open the floor to anybody that would like to speak, um, do you think that blinding is like an effective way of handling this issue? Do you think that blinding um, in the, the paper that we talked about on Tuesday, do you think that if the data scientists were blind to, I guess, the treatment groups, do you think that the results would have been any different? I guess I'm a little unclear on what that means specifically for this example and also for the one you're asking about from, from last time. Could, could you say what that means, for example, for defect prediction to blind? What would you blind? Yeah, I think that they mean um, like blinding from, so like if I have two different classifiers that have different results um, after we've collected the data and we're going to analyze the data. Um, we have labels to separate the two data sets, but we don't know which label corresponds to which like classifier, I guess. So then if we're analyzing the data, um, we use whatever analysis techniques that we think are appropriate and then we end up with some set of results. Whereas without blinding, what might happen is you do some, you know, exploratory stuff with your data. Um, you know the direction that you want your data to point, and you also think that your data should point in a certain direction. That your classifier should be better than the other data. Um, so maybe consciously and subconsciously, you are crafting your analysis such that your conclusions will hold mm -hmm. after the data analysis. Mm -hmm. On the same note, you will see that um, there is this push in the, um, some of the areas of software engineering right now, and, and I'm sure in other areas of science as well, uh, probably for much longer, uh, to pre-register studies. Have you heard about this? So this is the idea that before you start exploring the data uh, and sort of maybe slightly bias your analysis and, and data cleaning and filtering and things towards the results you're hoping to obtain and or towards the results that are starting to emerge or that you have a preference for, Instead of doing that, which is maybe the typical practice and that's subject to these researcher biases that you're referring to here, um, you're saying you're, you're committing ahead of time before you get to look at the data, you're committing to exactly all of the filters, the aggregations, the statistics, the everything you're going to do to that data um, so as to avoid you know, chopping it up, carving it up in, in such a way that uh, gets you to the results you're hoping to obtain. Uh, so that by the time you um, get to actually do all of this analysis and write your actual paper with the results, that an analysis in the final paper should match entirely the one you committed to in this pre-registration. For example, the Mining Software Repositories Conference, which is a very data science heavy area of software engineering research, um, has introduced, I think, starting this year, this um, track uh, for sort of pre-registered reports for exactly this purpose. Or people commit to some study they are looking to do and the specifics of the analysis that they're hoping to do on, on that data. They commit to that before they actually look at the data at all. So it's an interesting idea. It's it's in an, an attempt to 
uh, reduce these researcher biases that you're mentioning. How, how well has that, I guess, worked where it's been tried? It's, it sounds like it would be a nice thing to have, but I would imagine that it's just hard to know these things ahead of time and not change. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, I, I don't know how well it's worked in other areas. I, but I, I do think it's been tried in uh, sort of the medical sciences and that sort of area. It's been tried before or there. It's probably easier to commit to something like this when you're doing an experiment or some, something that has more uh, natural control for uh, confounding factors and covariates than something that's very observational and very subject to all kinds of data cleaning and filtering. Um, so, so I don't know. And, and also if we've learned anything from Bobo's paper on Tuesday, is that even we, if we commit to a data set and an analysis, it seems like we still end up with any results you can imagine on that data set with that analysis because of some, I don't know, other steps that we happen to have not committed to or because of whatever other reasons. I'm still unclear on, <laughs> on what happened on Tuesday. So, so I don't know. Personally, I'm a little skeptical. Like, um, A lot of this analysis you've seen is, is artful, so it's not easily prescribed ahead of time. It's sort of dependent on uh, kinds of noise and things you observe in, in the data you've collected. So I don't know to which extent you can fully commit, uh, but you know maybe I can imagine you can commit to certain kinds of protocols for, for cleaning data, for filtering and, and so on. And you so commit to a range of such things, but you still have some choice in which one to apply when, depending on what comes out uh, from, your, from your data collection. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how this works. Yeah, well, I guess also having like this pre-registered thing could also, like even if you have to change something after the fact, it might make it so that the author has to present an argument for why they believe that it is valid to change the thing that they're changing mm -hmm. um, rather than just doing things willy-nilly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, great, I agree. That sounds like a good idea. So, 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 so last week in, in, in our group, uh, so Ben also uh, shared a, a, a blog that talks about incentives in, in science. So, it, so it's like the incentive to publish good data in order to get into top tier conference, in order to get a good job in the future. So, so I'm thinking, so for this pre-registered uh, method, what if, so I claim I will use the following steps to to process the data. And what if I didn't get the positive result I want? Should the conference still accept the paper they publish or they, they, they submit? I think this is kind of, so So I can do what I claim to do, but I also want to get a good result. So I, I mean, <laughs> a lot of people, they, they kind of play tricks with their data because they want to get a good result, right? So here we introduce the bias because we first have a hypothesis. And if we, if we test our hypothesis is true, then we can probably get a good, good, paper, good publication. Mm -hmm. right. so, so I'm thinking how this previous thing would work if, they, if the researcher didn't get the result they want. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question. And I don't know that I have an answer to that. Um, but, but you're right, I think it is harder to publish negative results. Uh, this is something that comes up repeatedly, uh, right? So if you get the result you're hoping for or that people will 
expect and enjoy, your paper is much more likely to get accepted. If you compare something to something else and there's no difference, it's much less likely that your paper is going to get accepted and published, even if that's the correct answer, right? <laughs> right. So it's, yeah, I, I, uh, I wish I knew, right? So I, I don't know how to reconcile these. I think, I think that's an excellent question. But it's the reason that it's hard to publish negative results because of the low statistical power of the tools we are using today. It's more likely to make type two error than type one error. It's basically saying that if we find no significant result, it's very likely we are wrong. So it would be very hard to interpret uh, insignificant result, whether it's because the result doesn't exist or whether it's because the low statistical power of the tool we use. That's true, but I think also because reviewers expect positive results. There's just like researchers, Remember, reviewers are researchers too. They're our peers. They're people like us that do studies and write papers themselves, like we do studies and write papers. So if, if we, the researchers, have this bias towards finding results where there aren't any, the, the reviewers have this expectation too. I, I, I may not agree with that because from my perspective, if you show me a result that you can have enough evidence saying that we have proved that something doesn't have an effect on something or mm -hmm. some policies doesn't work to solve some problems. I think it's definitely significant scientific contribution. But if you only just tell me that your model doesn't show significant effect and it's not very solid scientific proof, it's just saying that you are using a poor tool to so show you that you don't see you don't see something significant. So I guess that's the reason I would reject the paper. It's not because the result, uh, it's not because there's no effect. It's just that uh, you can't prove it's no effect. Mm -hmm. I think you're you're forgetting this uh, entire discussion we had on Tuesday about beliefs and values and politics and how those shape what we consider to be acceptable science and an unacceptable science, how it's hard to separate the research from the researcher. So I think, you know, I, the argument you're making is, is valid in a sort of idealized scenario where you can separate the research from the researcher. Right? I don't think we're there yet. Well, okay, but thanks, thanks, Ben. This sounds like um, a worthwhile paper to read. So how about we we switch over to Kyle? Uh, there was a lot of drama. I've been following this uh, discussion. Uh, I don't know if you were aware of the, all the drama that um, happened around these, um, these studies. Uh, just for context, the original paper um, was a conference paper in 2014, and then there was an extended journal version of that conference paper a few years later um, that had some more details and a, a couple of small, uh, as I remember, corrections that the authors have made to the original data set and or analysis, something that they had discovered in between the, the conference version and the journal version. So I, I guess the journal version would be the more authoritative version of, of that original study. Um, and, and then there was a replication by a, an independent set of researchers. Um, so complaining about all kinds of things and, and um, a lot of drama around that uh, afterwards. It was all over social media. It was you know, talks at different conferences. Um, there's video recordings of, of these talks. You can, you can follow them. You can watch them on your own. Um, so it was a, a, a lot of a lot of very public disagreement and debate between the two sets of authors, uh, the set of authors of the original study and the set of authors of the uh, replication. 
Um, I thought this was a great example to discuss in, in class today because it sort of uh, illustrates these points that uh, both Ben and Bobo have uh, highlighted in the papers they presented about uh, different variation points in, in empirical research on the same topic, how you know, the different ways of measuring things, different ways of analyzing the data, the, the research teams uh, being different, how all of these could lead or not, that's a question for today for this class, um, or not to, to different results. So, so let's see, uh, Kyle, you know, take it away. Sounds good. All right, so yeah. So basically the papers we're gonna discuss is looking at programming languages and the code quality, um, especially um, using GitHub to try to see if there's any relationship between the programming language that you're using and also code quality. So just to talk about a few, I guess, terms in the beginning, um, it's not it's not terribly important in terms of understanding like the um, like the differences the authors had, um, but I think it would still be a good idea to know um, because there are some there is like a point where they talk about or they do differ about how to categorize a programming language. So um, we'll just quickly go over them. So the four different types that they are the four different characterizations they use for languages are basically the four that we have listed here, which is the language paradigm. Um, imperative is probably the most familiar to all of us. Um, it's like C, C++. Um, it's where you state or where you write code in an uh, incremental manner. So the compiler looks or the code looks at one statement and then runs to the next statement. Um, the next one is functional. Um, this is a different paradigm in which you try to write everything in terms of functions, and um, you try to avoid state mainly in these in these um, uh, in these languages. And um, it, it's very mathematical, and um, a lot of academia really likes functional programming languages, though it's been having difficulty. Well, that's changed recently, but. Um, it's having difficulty finding its foot in industry and um, scripting languages, which is uh, kind of like Python, um, Ruby. Um, these languages are meant to be um, used for uh, fast development. Um, next one is compilation type. Um, they define it as static and dynamic. Um, static is essentially are, are your types um, known statically. And then if they are known, then um, you can remove types uh, when you do runtime um, because you do all this checking of types um, before you run the program. And dynamic is the other way around in which you keep type information when you run the program and um, you check for the types every time you um, access the type or access the um, variable. Type system is, um, this is a little contentious, strong and weak. These don't really have good definitions in the PL community. Um, they're usually avoided, but um, for whatever reason, they, um, the authors have decided to use strong and weak. And their definition of strong, of a strong type system is one where you, um, you are not allowed to do, or you're not allowed to like break the type rules in, in a sense, like when you add two different, or when you combine two different types that are not, they don't have like a defined um, operation between them then uh, the, they'll throw an error. Um, so then they argue that um, C is weakly typed because you could potentially do like a, a cast pointer or you can cast your objects. So um, you can treat them as different types. And then they also talk about memory management, which is um, essential. It's uh, basically a yes or no thing for a language. Wait, okay, there you go. All right, so for the first paper we'll, we're talking about is the large scale study of PL and the code quality using GitHub. So they wanted to answer four research questions. Um, essentially, uh, are some languages more defect prone than others? Um, which language properties are the, uh, relate to defects, which are the language properties that we discussed on the previous slide? Um, does language defect proneness depend on domain, which is like um, the type of application, uh, the type of program that you're writing? 
Um, and the fourth one is the relationship between language and the bug, the bug category. Um, and we'll go into detail what that means later. So looking at research question one, um, what they did is that they, um, they took 17 languages and they examined the number of bug fixing commits on top of the top 50 most popular projects for each of those 17 languages. Um, of course, some they wanted to make sure that they're actually using large um, projects. So they filtered out these, um, they filtered these uh, by saying that we need to have at least 28 commits and anything less than 28 commits, we just ignore because we don't consider that as a large project. Um, also, if they use multiple languages, then the primary language for that project needs to have at least more than 20 commits before it can be considered um, part of that language. Um, so they used a machine learning model to classify uh, bug commits, and um, that, that's what their dependent variable was. So they classified bugs as um, commits that are addressing bugs. So it would be a commit specifically for fixing a bug. And they use a machine learning model. Um, it was it was based off of like an NLP model. It kind of looks at the um, every commit and sees like the message inside of it. And if it has like a few set keywords, um, it would flag that uh, message uh, that commit as a bug commit. And then also using NLP, they could be they could also classify what type of commit it was, um, like what type of bug it was, whether it was like you know related to. Uh, pro, uh, parallel programming, um, security bugs, such like that, and they um, then they could classify what type of bug that commit was. So um, yeah, they use bug commits as a dependent variable, and then they used um, uh, this negative binomial regression on um, the the data. Um, their independent variables were um, the age of the project, the number of commits, the size. Um, the developers for a project and a language. Um, the size refers to the um, line of commits added by each commit. And these are only additions, by the way. And uh, they log transform all of these, um, uh, all of these variables except the language. So the, the, uh, the, ver uh, the constants, not the constants, the, um, the, the weights that they use for the language are weighted constants. Um, so these correspond to the deviations of average of the deviations to the average of the bug commits in the data set. So after doing all this, um, they found that um, the result was that some languages have a greater association with defects with other language uh, than other languages, uh, although the effect is quite small. There you go. So then the next question that they wanted to ask, uh, they wanted to answer was um, if languages properties relate to defects. So they categorize languages into different PL characteristics, um, which we went over in the first slide. Um, so as we can see in this, um, the figure, um, they have like, they managed to take all the languages and put them into these separate bins, um, uh, these disjoint bins. So from this that they found that there was a small but significant relationship between language class and defects, and there was a preference towards functional languages having less defects. So, um, yes, uh, for language defect proneness, depending on the domain. So um, basically for each project, they uh, looked at the type of the project and they classified them into one of these um, eight or seven categories as shown on the x-axis for the domain um, in this uh, kind of plot. And they kind of found that there was no general relationship between domain and language defect proneness. And I guess I'll add in, um, I'll add that they were kind of hinting also that this maybe indicates that language is the main factor in why bugs are here. Though I think that that claim is a little bit too far-fetched. Um, but yeah, they were hinting at that essentially um, in this section as well. And uh, the last research question was between language and bug category. And so this one is difficult to answer because um, not all bugs are equivalent because um, 
they're um what what could classify as a bug is saying like oh this um this driver for maybe if you're working in linux this new driver like a usb driver that shows up um that could be considered a bug because it doesn't work but um adding that functionality into the language isn't really a bug that you want to consider because that's something that's domain specific um rather than like a general bug which is saying um maybe you did like a um a buffer overflow or something so they wanted to differentiate that, but they couldn't. Um, but they did note that there was this issue of a relationship. So they did note that they use mixed methods here, though I I don't really understand why they called it a mixed method. Um, they said they, from what I understand it, they said that they use the des descriptive visualization approach, which I assume is like the similar um, graph like for the research the research question three that we looked at before where we had the graph um i guess the density graph um similar to here and i think that's what they meant by mixed method though i think that's um, maybe a mischaracterization of a mixed method um so yeah um they also did like a regression model based off of this um another i think it was a binomial a negative binomial regression as well and then um, they, the result they got was that defect types are strongly associated with languages. And some defect types like memory error, um, concurrency error is also dependent on, dependent on language primitives. Um, and language matters more for specific categories than it does for defects overall. So having knowing all this, um, there was a reproduction study of this F, uh, Ray et al. Um, we can call it the FSE paper because that's, I guess, the, the conference that they apply it towards. Um, so this was done because a lot of causality, uh, a lot of papers after after this FSE paper came out um, implied that there was a causality between um, language and bugs. And this wasn't the case because um, this this is really a correlation study rather than a causation study. So they wanted to do a reproduction study of the entire uh, paper and basically they couldn't. So um, I'll kind of talk about what repetition, reanalysis and reproduction is. Um, so there's a typo here, it's not repetition. I don't think there's a term, this should be repetition. Um, so repetition is basically using the same data and the methods and you should get the same numeric results. Um, Reanalysis is examining the robustness of the conclusion, um, and uh, though the broad maybe um, some changes you get some slight changes, the broad conclusion should hold. And a reproduction is the gold standard in which you do um, a fully fledged independent experiment with different data and potentially the same or different methods. So yeah, um, I guess knowing in advance, we can, we see here that they tried to do repetition on all of these, and they could only rep repeat the first one and they couldn't do, they couldn't repeat any of the other um, three research questions. So yeah, um, we can jump into a lot of the issues that they found. Um, I can just, they, they identified, I think 20 within <laughs> their paper, but um, I only, I only put in the ones that are, uh, that they tried to make uh, changes towards because some of them, they noted that there were some issues, but they didn't make any, um, attempts to fix them either through this uh, rep replications or through their replication study. So uh, yes, so some projects were incorrectly classified when they were doing um, when they were doing these um, popular projects like um, V8. V8 is a, I believe it's a compiler for JavaScript is like a runtime engine. Um, so one would naturally think that you classify it under JavaScript, but um, actually it's written mainly in C and C++. So then but a lot of the artifacts are in JavaScript. So um, you have this weird double sharing of C and JavaScript. So um, what they did in the replication study was they removed V8 um, from the projects. Um, they also found, they also looked at the bug commits because um, how they were generating these dependent, um, these uh, the bug commit was through a machine learning model. They wanted to make sure that that was actually accurate. So they found, they went through it and they found that actually 36% of, well, they, they claimed that 36% of the bug reports, uh, bug commits were incorrectly classified um, because 
based off of the machine learning model that they were using, um, it would classify something like, um, it was like, oh, for example, um, fix was one of the words that they were using for uh, classifying as a bug commit. And um, if a commit showed up as like something saying infix, which is um, uh, uh, infix uh, shows up in like the bug commit, it, or in the commit, it may not actually be a bug. It, it may just saying like, oh, support for infix commands or something. And um, that would classify it as a bug commit. So they they stated that they found 36% of them like this. And they found that also that some of them were duplicated as well. Um, so they also noted that the FSE paper uses committers instead of developers, which are a subset of developers because committers are developers that have commit or have com uh, kind of like write access and you can do commits to the um, repository. Um, also the size, as we noted before, only accounts for like the additions of the commit. They don't account for deletions of commits, which are, could be potential, uh, yeah, because maybe a bug is something that you added and um, simply deleting the code would fix it. So us might be a small thing, but yeah, essentially the idea of this paper was that they could only repeat the first research questions based off of these changes that they made. Um, they also use a slightly different um, zero, uh, weighting for the languages. They use zero sum con contrasts. Um, this was because they said that um, the earlier method, um, they were using like a weighted, uh, the weighted constants. That's very susceptible if the data isn't um, clean. Like uh, they noted that because like there's so many inconsistencies in the data um, using these weighted, co weighted constants are very susceptible to these. So they use zero sum contrasts instead. So, but they were able to reproduce uh, research question one. And then for the other three research questions, they basically said they couldn't. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I see that we don't have much time. So I guess I'll stop here and then um, we can go into questions. For context, did you look at any of the follow up? So um, sequence of events, there was a paper, let's call it the FSE paper by the original authors. And in fact, the subsequent journal paper, I'm, I'm going to refer to that as well uh, as part of what I call the FSC paper um, by the same set of or authors as the original paper. So there was that. Then there was this uh, replication that you just mentioned, the reproduction study. Um, then there was a response that the FSC authors put out to this replication. And then there was a rebuttal by the replication authors to the response. Did, did you take a look at any of this additional context? And is there a more kind of a, a broader conclusion or, or picture or story from all of this? Yeah, I think, uh, so I briefly scanned both. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think, yeah, I didn't finish both of them, but um, yeah, I kind of saw the interaction between the two. Um, it seems like, so I thought that probably the best summary was the rebuttal to the response because that covered, I guess, most of everything. I don't know if, I guess they haven't done a rebuttal a response to the rebuttal yet, but <laughs> um, aside from that, um, essentially they had 20 issues that they found. I, I are this, um, this, uh, the paper in response to the FSE, like this one, um, they listed 20 issues with it and they fixed, I believe, eight. Eight of those, they fixed for eight of those issues in this paper. Um, the response only, they, they quoted um, that the response only highlighted maybe two, two of the issues or some that they said that they claimed, um, two of the 20 that they claimed. And uh, they kind of went back and looked at all of the 20 issues again in the rebuttal and um, kind of went through each of them and said um, whether that they had uh, responded in some sort of kind or um, if they did have contentions with that um, response that they also had a like a, another rebuttal response to their <laughs> response. So uh, I, I feel like 
from my understanding, the res the rebuttal did a very good job in terms of talking about the points that they had made for the original paper that they have here, and also to the response because um, for each one they they specified whether um, yeah whether it was they had like a separate I guess paragraph for each one so. <laughs> I feel like they were very clear in terms of what they found wrong with the paper. What do you all think? Uh, if you've read the papers or um, from what you've heard from Kyle now, Let me ask this way. It seems it seems pretty clear that there um, were tons and tons and tons of uh, these experimental empirical uh, design decisions that uh, both the authors of the original paper and the reproduction re replication have made, um, or or anyone could have would have should have made to study something like this. There are countless of these um, operationalization decisions, measurement decisions, analysis decisions, aggregation decisions, cleaning and filtering decisions, and so on and so forth. Countless of these. Um, from what we've seen from Bobo and Ben, uh, it should be I think no surprise anymore that. Um, these are points of variation in the results of any study and the, maybe the conclusions of the studies. Um, like obviously, you know, if you change any any subset of these, you can expect to get somewhat different results, right? Because something changes. If you change the input somehow, you can expect the output to change. Uh, I think I think we agree on that. What I'm was wondering is what your thoughts were on. You know, and st stepping back from all of this, if I look at this at a you know somewhat higher level, so yeah, so absolutely. You know, the, the, in the details, in the, in the small, low-level details, things um, are somewhat different and expected to be somewhat different. But if I step back and look at this from afar, it seems to me, upon reading these, that I'm maybe oversimplifying, but that's that's the question to this room right now. It seems like there was little in the way of an effect of programming languages on bugs in the original paper, the FSE paper, and still little, so little to no effect in the FSE study, and still little to no effect in the replication, even if slightly differently little to no effect. Right, so I, I think we agree on the slightly differently. But what I'm wondering is, like, am I reading this right? Am I reading the little to no effect originally and the little to no effect, but differently little to no effect uh, subsequently? No, I think you're right. I think what was what was contentious what was contentious was that a lot of papers were taking into account or were taking this correlation study and mis uh, misrepresenting it as a causal study. And they wanted to go back and um, see if they could replicate it and see if like um, the correlational study was correct. And they were actually able to like, although they couldn't repeat some of these, they actually kind of reached the same conclusion for many of the research questions. Um, so um, I think they just wanted to, well, they also had a lot of beef, but <laughs> I think the original purpose was to see, was to clear up any misconceptions about um, causality and correlation with the study. Okay, but you know, as far as correlate, yeah, so um, the method here and in either of the two sets of methods seems sufficient for causal claims, uh, neither the original nor the replication one. Um, but sticking to this as a correlational study, um, if 
say this big this big question that existed uh, since forever uh, in the programming languages world or software engineering world um, question of you know does any of this matter like is it really uh, worth designing new abstractions do we get better performance in some way um, better outcomes with better abstractions right that's sort of a lot of what people do in software engineering and programming languages is design abstractions and languages and so on. So, so if, if this is the big question, it seems to me that the answer to the big question, uh, as far as we can tell from both the original and the replication study, is that it doesn't matter much. That the differences are quite small. Uh, no matter how you measure this, more more or less precisely, it's still the case that the differences are quite small, if any. Is that a fair summary of what happened here? So you know, in in other words, let's say let's say I I'm I don't know, let's say I have a preference for imperative languages over functional for whatever reason, or the opposite. Let's say I'm a functional programming advocate and I hate imperative languages, right? Um, you know, would I take the, so if I took the original study as evidence to support whatever preference I might have, um, would the replication change that, materially change that? Like, would I, would I now believe something else? Um, I guess from what I guess from what we've been seeing, I I would say probably not. Um, in terms of uh, so in terms of only bugs. Mm -hmm. um well I, I think it's tricky because like some of these research questions um so like, like uh i think it depends how you look at um maybe uh if you look like how you look at bugs and the language um so because like maybe if you're looking at if you're looking at maybe like the type of the research, uh, the type of the language, maybe research question two is more um, relevant to you. Um, and uh, I think in research question two, they actually found that there was a difference between the original paper. Um, and they said, they claimed that uh, language classification doesn't change. Um, there's no correlation between bugs. But if you were to pick between a language specifically um, and in research question one, they did prove that um, picking a different, like if you pick different languages, you do get different uh, defect proneness. So it might depend on what your view of um, functional versus imperative is. Is it between two languages or is it between in generality? Um, because yeah, I guess these research questions could imply different things but um, about it. You know, even if if it, if it's specifically about two languages, um, as I remember, both of these, the original and the replication, the you know, remember when we talked about doing all kinds of data analysis and statistics on data, um, we talked about two things. We always, I insisted on two things. I insisted on um, not just statistical significance, which is this notion of, you know, can, can I be confident that these two groups of things are different? Um, how confident can I be sort of, uh, but not insisting not just on that, but also on um, estimating how practically relevant these differences are. And I've been making this uh, argument all along that with big data sets of which which is common in the areas where we're doing research because data is relatively cheap from, I don't know, GitHub and so on. With big data sets, you always find 
statistically significant differences. It's more of a question of, uh, are these differences also practically relevant? In other words, so sure, like, um, you know, so yes, I get, you know, 0.1% more bugs or fewer bugs, statistically significantly more or fewer, uh, but, you know, is the 0.1 more bugs or fewer bugs, is that really going to affect anything in terms of how I spend resources or whether I decide to use this tool or not, or piece of software or not, or things like that. So is it, so yes, it's statistically significantly different, but is it also practically meaningfully different? Is it, is it practically relevant? Um, so here, my read of these two was that they found different statistically significant differences. Um, and, you know, arguably the replication ones may, uh, corrected lots of, of measurement errors and so on from the original study. Uh, and that was all great. Uh, but it seemed in the end that, you know, if, if, if say based on the original study, I had chosen to program functionally um, expecting fewer bugs, I, I can't really change my mind all that much after the replication uh, because the effects were still relatively small. I thought they were so small to begin with and they stayed small afterwards, just different. Yeah. I think that's true. And um, I think it also it also is dependent on like the theory that um, bugs are time consuming and reducing or reducing like the number of bugs would mean reducing the amount of work for a project. But um, I guess, yeah, it seems like, well, a project could also have lots of other things like, you know, learning curve and um, I guess program complexity and other such like development as such. So um, even then, I think it's hard to say the effect of like bug differences on in terms of like um, how quickly one can like write a project, which programming languages also have as well. So like maybe it's a, like the purpose for this paper was on bug defects, but like programming languages aren't just for bugs; they're yeah. also for like you know ease of writing and um, like uh, paradigms that they also host. So like, even then it shouldn't, I don't think like this should completely make a huge, uh, like a huge impact in terms of like a, how you would choose language. Like if you're infinite, if you're like super familiar with C and don't know anything about um, like Scala or anything, then like even if Scala has maybe potentially less bugs, it's, you're still gonna have to pay a huge cost in terms of learning Scala. So hmm. I, I think it should be very small in terms of how you pick, but um, I, yeah, it is interesting in terms of like how a language might affect maybe main maintenance of like a project or such. Then why all the fuss? Um, I think so. Languages are very difficult in terms of how to do studies on because it's very costly. Um, it's I think it's kind of similar to how we have in our machine learning models and like we don't under, we don't completely understand um like I think it's slightly different in the sense that machine learning we can, like we don't really understand the process uh for languages we kind of do understand it but the ways to find out about the process are just so costly and also the the life lifetime of a language has also affected that because languages I guess well, I guess our oldest language is 50 years old, but, or still widely used one. But like, even then, like these, these projects to find about these languages are probably require that amount of age to actually make a, um, to probably understand the language itself. And you also run the risk that the language might go out of use at that point. So um, you, you put a lot of resources into like finding about these informations about languages. So um, I think it is very, interesting to learn about, um, learn about these four languages. So let me end with Ben's question back to you all. Um, th does this mean that we shouldn't be studying these in the first place anymore? Is, that, is this the conclusion of this whole sequence of things is, is to not study this at all anymore?
my understanding of like the the people criticizing the original paper was that they the source of their frustration was a, a lot of it was just that you know there's this result that from this correlational study that um, you know functional languages have less defects than imperative languages and then subsequently people just started saying you know functional languages have less defects ignoring the magnitude and the fact that it was correlational mm -hmm. um, even like the authors that wrote the original paper subsequently forgot the you know scope of the outcomes um, so it seems like the big tricky thing with this kind of study is that you need to be careful about how you present your results and what your headline is. Hmm. So I guess the, the lesson is think three times, write once, or I like can measure twice, cut once, or think twice, write once. Think about all the ways in which your paper is going to be misinterpreted and misrepresented by readers later on, uh, if not if not by yourself, um, and and so write very carefully. So that's that seems like a slightly optimistic way to end. Uh, let's end with this before we get depressed again, like we. we started uh, today and like we left off on Tuesday. Let's end with um, think twice, write once as the conclusion from this. Think of all the ways in which your work is gonna be misrepresented and misquoted and write with that in mind to, to reduce the risk of that happening. All right, well, so thank you very much. This was, this was really enjoyable. Um, I will see you on Tuesday and Thursday next week for final presentations. I've sent an email out with a proposed schedule and some advice for what to include in the presentations. Um, hopefully you've received that via Canvas. Okay, so if, if you have any suggestions or changes or ideas for that, just let me know and we can, we can adjust that. And if not, I'll see you on Tuesday. All right, thank you so much.